Guys, your Bible translation questions are awesome. I love your questions. And I am going to answer one today about copyrights and Bibles. Now, about those questions, I read years ago that C.S. Lewis patiently answered all his mail with the help of his brother, Warney. But uh, I don't have a brother, and I'm struggling to keep up, to be honest. So I just have to ask you, please don't be offended if I can't get to your question. In fact, the better your question, the less likely it is that I'm going to be able to get back to you, or at least get back to you quickly. But equally, please don't stop sending me messages. I get great ideas from you, way more ideas than I'll ever be able to do videos on. I absolutely love these ideas. Honestly, I love seeing people work hard on their Bibles, and I love seeing people pick up the cast of mind that it takes to work with words. So I got a question from a missionary friend of mine named Emmanuel Transmission serves in a place called Zambibia, or maybe it was New South Azuela, or Nasarima. Suffice it to say that I'm going to leave his identity out of this video because he has a strong King James only background. I actually don't know if he's supported by King James only us now or not, but KJV only missionaries on the field often encounter other languages and discover that their neat and tidy ideas about Bible translation were only neat and tidy because no one had ever removed them from their packaging and actually looked at them. But far from the pressures of the American ecclesiastical scene, living among a bunch of Christians who clearly love the Lord but have never even heard of the King James, not a few of these missionaries start to realize that they were wrong about the King James. And then they find me and then they talk to me. This young man, I'll tell you that much, was one example. I do encourage such folks to be honest with their mission boards and their sending and supporting churches if they're King James only. And in at least one case, that yet led to a young man very far away from here losing a huge chunk of his support practically immediately. This is a tough place to be in. Anyway, this young man and I have had some correspondence over time. And this is what he asked me recently. Hello, Dr. Ward. I am hoping that you can help answer a question that I continue to have. Even after completely leaving the King James Only movement and thinking that I was trained in, it has to do with copyrights on the various translations. As you know, King James Only proponents flaunt the public domain status of the King James, often forgetting the crown copyright that the KJV is under. That's true. The King James is copywritten in Britain, or copyrighted. However, he says, I've also heard them use the copyright argument in other ways. And there's this other aspect of copyright that he says puzzled him. I think the issue, he says, mostly will come down to the fact that I simply don't understand exactly how copyright works. Also, copyright works differently in different countries, which of course is true. I have heard King James only proponents argue that translators must intentionally reword portions of their translations to make them original and therefore able to be copyrighted. Basically, they argue that because so many modern English versions exist and there are only so many faithful ways of expressing the same thought, that new modern translations must eventually be forced to wrongfully change passages in order to meet the minimum threshold necessary to be considered new or different from previous Bibles. This is a sharp guy who writes well. That was an elegant and a very precise sentence. Well done. I love that. He said to me, I do not believe this argument, but at the same time, I don't know the correct rebuttal to this argument. I would love to learn more about how this works. He told me, I know from reading in my parallel King James, NIV, NASB, Amplified Bible, which is exactly the Bible that I got when I was uh, 18 years old and first bought a comparative study Bible. He says, I know from checking these translations in Logos that many verses are surprisingly similar, virtually identical. I'm also currently working through One Bible Many Versions by Dave Brunn. His many comparison charts show that in many instances, portions of verses in different translations are exactly identical. These are appropriate and even excellent thoughts, and Brunn's book has had a massive impact on me. I should interview him. This missionary asked me. My question is, what effect, if any, does copyright law have on the actual final product of a Bible translation? Do Bible publishers factor in copyright law into how they word a particular passage or their decision? 
and how often to use a particular word, etc. Okay, I, there was a big lead up here. I, I let this missionary talk with a long question. Uh, I myself want to do some more work on the legalities here. I've spoken recently and at length with a copyright expert, but I'm still most fundamentally a Bible guy, and I just can't say I'm really ready to speak in detail about copyright law in the U.S. or even in Zambibia. I might have someone on the channel do so with me at some point, but I can talk with four or five ounces of intelligence, I think, about the Bible and about Bible translation. I wrote back to this missionary something like this. First, I've never heard anyone talk about this possibility of translations being affected by copyright except King James onlyists, and they never give any evidence whatsoever, not a single line from legal statutes or case law, not a single passage in a single translation in which the only or best explanation for the difference it has from other translations is copyright. I believe the opposite, in fact, that copyright figures not one whit into the considerations of modern Bible translators. I think it would be impossible to find a single verse in all of scripture where there aren't multiple English Bible translations that are obviously incredibly similar, suggesting strongly that copyright is not a concern for them, or at least not at the level of individual translation choices. Second, I have worked in countless passages in both Testaments and all the major modern evangelical English Bible translations, and I myself had never once seen any evidence that needless changes were made for copyright reasons. I only started to hear this idea that you know each new Bible had to change the scriptural text by 10% in order to get a fresh copyright. I only started hearing this a few years back, and it's, it's hard to explain how this struck me. I felt like I was a mechanic who has worked on every single Mustang that has ever existed, even the Mach-E, and this guy comes into my shop insisting to me that Ford silently chose many decades ago not to put anti-lock brakes into any Mustangs, despite the laws about such things, you know, just to save money. Ford figured that no one would catch them because no one would ever believe they would do such a massively bad and unhideable thing, you know, it just never occurred to anyone to check. But for purposes of illustration, I'm a mechanic who has fixed countless anti-lock brake systems on countless Mustangs. If I heard this conspiracy theory, I would be sputtering mad, mad because it's just a falsity made up out of thin air and repeated by people who apparently don't even know how to check it out for themselves and therefore, you know, ought to know this and shouldn't repeat rumors. Sputtering because how do you prove to people who don't seem to want to know the truth? and wouldn't know an anti-lock brake from a locking brake, what I simply know through repeated, direct, prolonged expo exposure to be false. Third, even if the conspiracy theory were right and modern Bibles all have to change the text of scripture by 10% in order to avoid copyright claims, those claims could be avoided by rewording the English to say precisely the same thing. King James defenders think of the King James as a perfect book Practically by definition, any change to a perfect book is an imperfection, right? It never occurs to them that there are multiple ways of saying the same thing. Even the King James sometimes translates the very same Greek or Hebrew words differently. Here's what I mean. The KJV has Jesus saying that the lilies of the field toil not, neither do they spin in Matthew 6, 28. In Luke 12, 27, however, translating exactly the same Greek words, okay? They say that the lilies toil not, they spin not. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this variation. The King James translators even mention in their preface that perfect consistency in translation is not their goal. This shows, though, that statements can vary and yet say the same thing, or consider the common exercise in English classes in which students must say the same thing ten different ways. I had AI write a sentence for me in the style of Charles Dickens, and I tried my hand at rewriting it. Here's the original sentence that AI gave me. The air was thick with the mournful cries of chimney sweeps, their brushes like blackbirds flitting across the soot-encrusted sky. I wrote these two sentences, rewording the Dickens language. All around them could be heard the sad cries of chimney cleaners. Their black brushes were like birds flying across smoke-covered heavens. Here's a second one. 
Everywhere, the chimney sweeps were crying out in doleful tones with their black brushes like so many birds darting from place to place in the smoldering sky. At this point, I confess, I got tired. It was 9.30 p.m. It's hard to keep up with YouTube. But I feel certain I could keep going for a long time. And this was just one sentence. More text makes this sort of thing easier, not harder. More text to translate means exponentially more opportunities to use synonyms or a different sentence structure, or yes, to reflect slight disagreements as to the meaning of a given phrase in Hebrew or Greek. I'm gonna belabor this point because I think it's actually the most important one that I'm going to make. I asked AI to send me a random Bible verse, I like doing this, and it sent me to Isaiah 45, 16. Let's use this verse to go through a similar exercise. Here's one way of putting this verse, followed by six other slightly different ways of putting the same thing. All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in confusion together. They shall be ashamed and also humiliated, all of them. The craftsmen of idols shall go away in confusion together. Third, they shall be ashamed and also disgraced, all of them. They shall go in confusion together, who are makers of idols. Fourth, they will be put to shame and even humiliated, all of them. The manufacturers of idols will go away together in humiliation. Fifth, all the makers of idols will be put to shame and disgrace. They will go off into disgrace together. Sixth, faster, all craftsmen who make idols will be humiliated. They will also be disgraced together. Seventh, they will all be ashamed and disgraced. The makers of idols will end up disgraced together. What I just read to you was clearly the same thing said in seven different ways. And I didn't need AI to do this work for me. Humans did it this time. We know these humans as the translators of the ESV, MEV, New King James, NASB, NIV, NLT, and CEB in that order, respectively. Now, why do we need all these translations when they're just saying the same thing? You know, honestly, that is a good question, and it's something I discuss in other videos, including future videos, Lord willing. But for now, another point, point four. Not only is it possible to say the same thing in different ways in a given language, it's actually humanly impossible to translate any text from any language to any other without differing in countless minor ways from other equally skilled, equally diligent translators. Bible translators don't have to try to produce variation on purpose in order to achieve it. It just happens. It happens quite naturally. This is true of any text whatsoever, not just the Bible. Witness the many translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer or of Augustine's Confessions. These translations, in my experience, tend to have more differences among them than do evangelical English Bible translations, simply because part of the purpose of translation for these literary texts is literary, and translators tend to want to make their literary mark. But Bible translations aim at fidelity to the originals, even if their translations have sometimes differing ideas about how much literalism fidelity requires. So they are usually very, very similar, Bible translations are. Even ancient people knew that translators would never ever make all the same choices as other translators. That's how the Septuagint got its name. Septuagint means 70. And the legend is that 70 translators entered 70 separate rooms and translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek. And they all came out after a certain amount of time with identical translations. That would be impossible, but for a miracle. And that was the point of the legend. Those who came up with this tale were trying to demonstrate their belief in God's involvement in the creation of the Septuagint. This, again, is humanly impossible. Now, I told my missionary friend that I do think that major evangelical translations are probably updated too often. I also think that most of the people who are upset by this are King James only but not all of them. I'll never forget being shocked when a very, very smart history professor expressed dismay on social media that his ESV edition was slightly different from that of his pastor, you know, a fact he discovered during a sermon. I just couldn't understand why he didn't understand that such things must occur. But he sobered me. He showed me that I can't lightly dismiss the concern Christian people have that there are too many English Bibles and too many updates. It's bewildering to a lot of people. I get that. I also believe that this is the strongest point that the King James only is have in their favor. In other words, a, a variation on the if it ain't broke, don't fix it principle. I would put it this way. Slightly broken is better than untested. 
I get the appeal of that viewpoint. I think that's a responsible viewpoint to take. I just think that multiple centuries of language change have broken not the King James, but our ability to understand it sufficiently that we can no longer justify its pulpit and other institutional use. However, I also think it isn't too hard to understand why translations get updated. And even to continue to use a given translation while acknowledging that not all the reasons for its existence or for its revisions are ideal. Was the creation of the King James ideal? It came from a church formed by a guy who couldn't get the Pope to give him a divorce. It entered a world shaped by the Elizabethan settlement in which some Catholic worship elements were allowed to persist in an otherwise Protestant church. It was the product of a state church, something most King James onlyists, in my experience, roundly reject, and about which I certainly myself have grave doubts. So, yes, there are some English Bible translations that even I think never should have come to be. I've gotten specific about about this while engaged in shop talk with other people who do the kind of work that I do. I just don't want to talk about it here on YouTube because I think regular Christian people who use these translations should not be dragged into the debate. Those translations I have in mind are just fine and I don't think there's any good reason to spoil the enjoyment and trust that people have in them. But yes, I think the English, translation, English Standard Version translation folks could have left the translation as it was in 2001. Uh, perhaps they should have. Same with the NIV in their 1984 edition. Maybe they just should have left it. The NASB 1995, I'm not so sure it needed the 2020 update. But a Logos user actually went through and tagged every single revision made to the ESV starting from its 2001 edition, including its light 2007 revision and then including its 2016 permanent text edition, so-called. Uh, and it's mostly very minor stuff, and there's not a whole lot of it, considering how big a book the Bible is. Be fruitful and multiply, team on the earth and multiply in it, from the 2001 ESV, became be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. That was probably an improvement, you know, a somewhat obscure, though nicely poetic word, like team, was replaced with a two-word phrase that far more people will understand, I, I would guess. The ESV folks were just doing their best to do exactly what the King James translator said they wanted to do, which was to polish the metal a bit more to make it gleam more brightly, to take their metalwork back to the anvil to have it pounded out just a bit more. That was the King James translator's goal. That's what they said they were doing. I took those two metallurgy illustrations straight from their preface. That's what the NIV 2011 translators were doing too. My fellow complementarians have often been critical of the NIV, but I read Doug Moo's justifications, he's complementarian by the way, and they are fundamentally sound in my opinion. He was trying to adjust to genuine scientifically provable changes in the English language. I talk about this in my NIV video. There is a sense in which Copyright concerns play an unfortunate role in the creation of new translations. The CSB exists. It's almost openly acknowledged because the Southern Baptist Convention didn't want to have to pay royalties on their countless published resources as they quote the NIV, let's say, you know, they have Royal Rangers and Sunday School stuff. But the top guy at the CSB was Tom Schreiner, one of the greatest living Baptist scholars whose knowledge and judgment are respected very, very widely, certainly by yours truly. He and his team did excellent work, just like the King James translators did excellent work, both because of and despite the historical circumstances that they worked in. When actual evangelical Bible scholars sit down to translate the actual words of God, I assure you that they don't think about anything but the need to get those words across to God's people as accurately as possible. Copyright just does not enter their minds. I often think of our King James only brothers are like the people in that old joke that we've all heard. So there's a flood and they, the people in this house pray for God to rescue them as the waters climb up, up against their house. A boat floats by offering to save them. Oh, no, 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 they say, we've prayed and God's gonna save us. 
The floods continue to rise. The people must move to the roof to get away from them. A helicopter comes and dangles a rope in front of their faces. Same result, oh no, 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 no thanks, you know. Uh, God's gonna rescue us. We have prayed to him. They drown. They find out up in heaven that it was actually God who sent the boat and the helicopter. You've probably heard this joke. Okay, it's not all that funny. Our King James Only brothers want God to give them a new translation, a perfect one that no one will disagree about and that won't have any of the touch of the human on it. They just don't see the touch of the human on the King James Version because those humans who touched it are long dead and their work is obscured by the glow of hallowed tradition. This just happened to me. A commenter who teaches at a King James Only college he told me that God, not man, determines when the King James Version needs updating because we believe in divine preservation. We cannot rationally discern or predict when, where, or how God will preserve his word. My best critic, Christopher Yetzer, recently said the same. The Spirit of God should be the guide to let us know if the Bible ever gets to the point of being so unintelligible that it would need revision, not a scientific predetermined number. He was responding to my video that talked about levels of unintelligibility. And I say with fear, you brothers nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. God says, use intelligible words so people can be edified. And these brothers say, we must not presume to obey God's word of this passage. We must wait till God gives us a special sign to know to obey him. This was wrong in Jesus' day when the Pharisees did it. It's wrong today. A brief fifth rebuttal I'll toss in because I'm just not ready to develop it at length. I have talked to, to two copyright experts about the claim that modern Bibles have to change 10% of the Bible text to get a new copyright. One expert that I spoke to is a copyright lawyer, actually, and the other is in charge of the text permissions department at a major Christian publisher that I used to work at as it happens. Both of them said that the idea that modern translations of the Bible have to change 10% of the text to get a fresh copyright was wrong to the point of crazy. They had never even heard of this and had no idea where it was coming from. I think I have more work to do on copyrights in Bibles. My respected friend, Andrew Case, who's been on this channel, has gotten me thinking that maybe copyrights in Bibles aren't as good and necessary as I always assumed. And yet the fact is that there are now many free English translations of the Bible into contemporary English, all of which you can read online, along with, of course, all the major copyrighted translations, which are also free online. And effectively all have free apps or are, or are available in free apps, and a number of them have free audio Bibles. The Berean Bible is a good concept, and its licensing page says this, all uses are freely permitted. If your conscience leads you away from copyrighted Bibles, there are now many good options for you. But I've never run into anyone who, A, complains about Bible copyrights, and B, prefers Texas Receptus Bibles, who has paid attention to the many Bibles, even TR-based translations, that attempt to meet their expressed concerns. God sends a boat, God sends a helicopter, and they say, no, no, no. I have to think that on the lips of most people who use it, the modern versions are copyrighted argument is what the Bible calls slander. It's a way of dismissing the work of the godly translators who have given their lives to the ESV or NIV or what have you by saying they're all just in it for the money. That is not right. It is not true. Don't stay on your roof and wait for a divine rescue that has already come. Just come downstairs and read a translation of the Bible into your own English. Then if you do drown, then you'll at least understand more of God's word while the water clogs your lungs.